Hello there, welcome back. This is the first of two chapters where we'll be learning about how garbage collection works. In this first chapter, we'll start by looking at when objects become eligible for garbage collection. As part of this, we'll see that there is an optimization that the virtual machine makes called string internalization, which reduces the number of string objects that get created in many applications. Then we'll talk about the finalize method, a method that every object has. We'll learn when it's called and how it can be used. And we'll talk about whether memory leaks are possible in Java. We'll also be using a visual tool in this chapter called Visual VM to look at the heap. So let's get started. The stack is very efficient. Java can manage it very easily. It knows that as soon as a closing curly bracket is reached, it can pop variables off the stack that were created within the scope of the code block that's being exited. The problem though with the stack is that its scope is so tight. It's based on code blocks. Often we want an object to live for a longer period of time than its enclosing scope. That is, we want to often share objects between code blocks. Here's a simple example. In this code, we're passing an object, the customer referenced by the variable C, from one method to another. The second method is referencing the object that we create in the first method. The actual object is being referenced here, not a copy of the object. If Java had put the data for the customer on the stack, it would become out of scope and therefore invisible in the second method. So the fact that Java creates the customer object on the heap means that it's able to be shared, in this case, with the second method. We've seen this already in this section of the course. We now know that's what the heap is for. It's a massive storage area for objects and the lifetimes of the objects on the heap are going to be very variable. Some might live only for a little while and some will live for a long time. If you've written code in other languages such as C, C++, Visual Basic or Pascal, you might be aware that in those and other languages, you have the choice when you create an object, whether you want it to be stored on the stack or on the heap. Java decided not to offer that choice, but to place all objects on the heap. The reason for this was that one of the design goals of Java was to simplify choices and, where possible, to provide a single, clean way of doing things. Now, you might well argue that this is far from the Java that we know today, but that was the goal back in the mid-1990s. Actually, modern virtual machines are very efficient and clever, and if they detect that an object you're creating is not going to be shared, that is, it doesn't go outside the code block in which it's created, then the virtual machine will in fact create that object on the stack. This is not something we need to know about, we won't see it and it won't impact anything we write, but I'm mentioning it just to point out that although Java doesn't give us any control over where objects are created, the virtual machine in reality makes the most efficient choice for us. So our code will generally run in an optimized way. There is a further optimization that virtual machines make, and I'm going to take a moment to mention this one as I think it's useful to know about. I've created a blank project here in Eclipse, but I'm not going to be doing very much in here, so you don't need to create this for yourself. Just sit back and watch what I'm about to do. I want to create some simple code that's going to generate two strings with identical values. So let's have a string called one with a value of hello, and a string called two with a value of hello. Now, from what we've learned, when this application runs, we expect there to be two variables on the stack pointing to two string objects on the heap. Well, and this point only applies to strings. That's not quite true. It's not quite what happens. Because strings are immutable, that is, they can't be changed, Java is clever enough to know that it's safe to make both of these stack variables point to a single object on the heap, the same string object. When the second variable is created, Java reuses the existing heap object 
and points the second variable to the same object as the first. This is known as internalized strings. Now we can check that that is the case. I remember teaching in the Java Fundamentals course that you need to be careful when you're comparing strings to use dot equals rather than equals equals. We know that dot equals tests value equality, whereas equals equals tests reference equality. So if these two variables are pointing to the same object on the heap, then equals equals will return true. Let's try it to see if that's the case. So if one equals equals two, then we'll print out they are the same object. And I'm going to put an else in, and if they're not, we'll print out they are different objects. I just need to put some semicolons at the end of that line. And if I run this now, well, we can see they are indeed the same object. So the virtual machine knows that there is no need to create a second string object with an identical value to the first. There's no harm in both of these stack variables pointing to the same object on the heap because strings are immutable. So although in our code we think of two string objects having been created, actually there's only one in reality. What actually happens with strings is that the virtual machine puts them into a pool and it will reuse the objects in this pool wherever it can. Now, in general, this only happens with little strings. It won't happen with strings that are calculated from something else. For example, if I create a further string, I'll call this one three, and set that equal to, I want to calculate it from something, so I'm going to create a new integer give it a value, let's say 76, then call it to string method. And let's create a little string with the same value. So we'll have string four equals 76. Well, if I compare string three and string four using equals equals, let me copy the if statement down to there. And this time we're comparing string three and four. If I run this now, we'll see that those second two strings are different objects. So Java hasn't been able to reuse the string it created for object three for object four. And that's because the string for object three did not get placed in the pool. Now there is a method on the string class to internalize a string, that is to force the virtual machine to place that string in the pool. And we can use this method where we think the string we're creating is important and it's therefore sensible to reuse. The method's called intern, and all I need to do is at the end of the to string method call dot intern. If I run this again now, well, we'll see this time they're the same object. Now, I've rarely seen the intern method used in reality. Java will automatically place literal strings into the pool anyway, so it's only these calculated strings that aren't placed in the pool. Now, the reason to use intern is that, of course, it's better for any strings that are going to be reused a lot to be in the pool, as this will minimize the number of objects created and needing to be garbage collected we'll be saving the creation of lots of duplicate objects. But if we're having to use intern, there is, of course, the expense of running that intern method. So what we've just seen here is a couple of different ways in which the Java Virtual Machine optimizes the creation of objects. It sometimes places objects on the stack, and with strings, it might not create duplicate objects. But for now, let's put this information to one side and continue to work on the basis that all objects are created on the heap as separate objects. While we know it's not completely true, this is a good enough assumption, it's a good starting point to continue to learn about garbage collection. One of the other differences between Java and some programming languages you might have used, such as C, are that when you have finished using an object, you don't have to tell Java that it's no longer needed. Java works this out automatically. In languages like C or C++, the exact opposite is the case. For any object on the heap in these languages, the programmer must include code that tells the language that you've finished with this object. 
In C, you do this by calling a function called free. In Visual Basic, you're meant to set the object equal to null to expressly clear the reference to the object. If you don't do this, then the memory that is being used to store the object will never be released. Even when your program finishes running, the memory will still be in use. The only way to free it up is going to be to restart your computer. If the computer is a web server, well, we really don't want to have to restart it. This type of fault is called a memory leak. And if it occurs, it's a horrible problem because your program is actually compromising the integrity of the computer it is running on. If you're running programs with a memory leak, then over time, more and more of your computer's memory will get used up. And over time, your computer will start to slow down. Eventually, it will crash. Memory leaks are the nastiest form of a fault that a computer program can have. They're hard to detect and might be thought of as harmless because it can take so long before the impact is seen, and yet when the impact happens, it can be catastrophic. Finding memory leaks is incredibly difficult, and for programmers of languages like C, working out the exact point that an object is no longer needed can be very hard. So the good news is that Java decided to solve this problem by being a so-called managed language. This means two things. Memory leaks should be avoided because firstly, Java runs on a virtual machine. The point here is that when you call the new keyword in Java to create a new object, you aren't actually taking memory from the operating system. The memory is acquired by the virtual machine. Now, the virtual machine is actually just another computer program written in C. This C program will control the request for memory for objects from the operating system, and it controls the freeing of memory when objects are no longer needed. We can think of the virtual machine as deciding when to put in the call to the free function that C needs to release memory. And it's pretty safe to assume that the designers of the virtual machine have correctly ensured there are no leaks in this implementation. If there were some leaks, well, there'd be plenty of bug reports about it, and I'm sure we'd know. So if we assume that the virtual machine is correctly implemented, an operating system level memory leak in Java should be impossible. If it does happen, well, it's certainly not the fault of the programmer. The second way that Java avoids memory leaks is with the strategy of garbage collection. A common misconception is that Java invented garbage collection. It didn't. It was actually invented in 1959 with the Lisp programming language. Java, however, made the concept of garbage collection more popular. The idea of garbage collection is that programmers ask for objects to be allocated on the heap, but do not need to free them when they're finished with. Instead, an automatic process analyzes the heap and aims to work out which objects are no longer needed, and any unneeded objects can be deleted. Java works out which objects are no longer needed using a simple rule. Any object on the heap which cannot be reached through a reference from the stack is eligible for garbage collection. Let's have a look at an example. The object storing the double value 17.6 is not reachable from any local variable on the stack. Since it isn't referenced, it can never be used again, so it's garbage. It's eligible for garbage collection. We'll use the word garbage to describe this object, meaning it can be collected as garbage at some point in the future. The correct term to use here is unreachable objects on the heap are eligible for garbage collection. It's not quite correct to say unreferenced objects because it's possible for an object which is referenced to be garbage. Here, for example, we've got a list referencing two customer objects, but the reference to the collection has been lost. So we know that the collection is garbage but as the objects that are referenced by this collection are also unreachable, they are also garbage. It doesn't matter that they have references pointing to them. The other possibility is circular references. Here we've got an example of three objects that all reference each other, but none of them are reachable from the stack, so they're all garbage. They're all eligible for garbage collection. 
So the important point here is that Java works out which objects are eligible for garbage collection, and this is not something that is our responsibility as a programmer to control. As a programmer, we have very little control over the garbage collection process. The model is that your program should have no dealings with the garbage collector. It should be treated as an automatic process and you shouldn't want to interfere with it. However, there are some methods in the Java API that seem to have a bearing on the garbage collector. In particular, there is a method of the system class called GC. I've got on the screen here the Java docs for the GC method, and you'll see it says that the GC method suggests that the Java virtual machine runs the garbage collection process. So it's going to tell the virtual machine to run garbage collection, but there's no guarantee that the virtual machine will do. Let's see this method in use. There's an example project in the starting workspace for this chapter called Garbage Collection. So let's load up that project into Eclipse. So this project has two classes. There's a customer class, which we've actually seen many times before in this course. It's a straightforward class just with a single private variable and some get and set methods. And then in the main class, well, the first thing that happens is we get an instance of the runtime, and I'm just doing that so that I can call the free memory method to find out how much memory is available for my application. So we'll print that out to the console, and then I've got a loop that's running, I think that's a million times, and what's happening in the loop is we're creating new customers. Now note that these customers are instantly available for garbage collection because as soon as we encounter this close and curly bracket, then each customer that we create is no longer referenced by a variable on the stack. So the object, each customer that's created on the heap, is instantly available for garbage collection. After we create all these customers, I'm printing out the amount of memory that's left available to us. I'm then calling that GC method to suggest that the virtual machine should run the garbage collector and then printing out at the end how much memory is left. So I'm going to run this now. If you're following along, do the same. OK, so at the start, I had 247459 kilobytes available to me. After I create all of those customer objects, I've got 241, which is less. And then after the garbage collector runs, I've got 251. So it does look like in this instance that the garbage collector did run when I called .gc. We know that calling .gc is a suggestion that it should run. Of course, the garbage collector might well have run halfway through all of these customers being created as well. I have no idea at this stage if that happened or not. And on your computer, you might find that the garbage collector didn't run when you call GC, and this third number might be the same or even lower than this second number. So calling GC is a suggestion that it should run, but it's not a guarantee. It's usually not a good idea to run the GC command. Explaining why this is the case can be difficult, but it's worth thinking about the question, when should you tell the garbage collector to run? Now, one example might be if you're trying to evaluate whether two different alternative blocks of code are more or less efficient than each other. And it might seem useful to run a garbage collection before each of those code blocks runs to try and get a more accurate evaluation. You're trying to start each code block with the application in pretty much the same state. But as you can't guarantee that the garbage collector will run when you call GC, I don't think I'd even bother to do it in this extreme example. It should be noted that garbage collection will temporarily stop all threads in your application from running. While garbage collection takes place, your application is temporarily suspended and it won't resume until garbage collection is complete. For this reason, we want garbage collections to be quick and reasonably infrequent. So again, forcing one to happen is generally not a good idea. 
when an object is actually garbage collected, and by that I mean when the garbage collection process physically removes the object from the heap, rather than when it becomes eligible for garbage collection, well at that point Java runs its finalised method. Now I've got on screen here the Java docs for the finalised method from the java.lang.object and we can see that it says this method is actually called by the garbage collector. Let's edit our code to include something in this finalised method so that we can see it in action. So in the customer class we'll create the finalised method and the method signature is simply public void finalise. And let's just print out to the console that the object is being garbage collected. So we'll do system.out.println. This object is being, well, I'll just do GC for short. Now we'll run this. I think this time we'll just do 100 customers because we'll want to be able to look through our console. We don't want to have thousands of lines to scroll. And let's run this and see what happens. Well, here, this is quite interesting. If you remember, we call system.gc and then print out the available memory at the end. And we can see that the available memory at the end has gone up. So in this instance, when we only had 100 customers, the virtual machine decided not to run the garbage collection. And in fact, since then, it has run the garbage collection. And we can see a number of the objects have been destroyed and removed from the heap. but well, 100 certainly haven't been. I'd estimate there's probably about 10 or 11 there. So this finalize method, which seems like a useful idea, it seems like it's a good place to put in any code that's going to do some kind of cleanup, actually is pretty useless. The problem is that we're not going to know that it's definitely going to run, or if it is, when it is going to run. Something you must never do is close an open resource in the finalized method. If you do that, you'll never know when that resource is going to get closed. The point is that the garbage collector doesn't have to run. It chooses when it does. And when it does run, there's no guarantee that that particular object is going to be garbage collected that time round. So the important point here is that the garbage collector might not run and it won't run because it's only needed to keep the heap nice and tidy while your application's running. If your program reaches the end, even if the heap is cluttered with lots of objects which are eligible for garbage collection, the JVM might decide not to bother running the garbage collector. And in fact, if your application's finished, the JVM will be destroyed and removed from memory and the garbage collector will never run, these finalized methods will never be called. So you cannot rely on the finalized method being called. So with that in mind, it does feel like the finalized method has pretty much no use. The one time I have seen it being used is as a check that all resources have been closed. The code looked something like this. We had some kind of object which had a close file method which closed any open resources. And then in the finalized method for that object, well, a check was made to see if the file had been closed. And if it hadn't, then it logged out a message that the resource was not closed. So at least it was a way of checking that any client code was correctly calling the closed file method. Of course, there's no guarantee finalized would run. There's no guarantee we'd ever see this warning message. But if we did see it, that would be a hint that something was wrong. So we're not using finalize to correct the problem, but at least send out a warning that something could be wrong. I think that's pretty much the only real use for the finalize method. At this point, I think we should revisit the claim I made earlier that Java avoids memory leaks. I stated that because the Java virtual machine will automatically release all of its allocated memory back to the operating system, a traditional leak is not possible, at least assuming the Java virtual machine is correctly implemented. But some leaks are possible, and I'm going to refer to these as soft leaks. 
It's not an official term, but I'm going to call a soft leak where you have written code, or maybe a third party library you're using contains code, that somehow keeps an object live, even though you're never going to use it again. It should be garbage, but Java never considers it as such because it's referenced from somewhere on the stack. Now, in some instances, this isn't going to be a major problem because when the program ends, the virtual machine will perform the free call and the memory will be released at that point. So the memory won't be lost to the operating system. But while your program is running, you are holding memory that can never be used again, so you're running the risk of possibly running out of memory. Let's have a look at an example of a soft leak. The example project that I've got for this is once again in the starting workspace for this chapter, and it's called Soft Leaks. So locate that project and load it up in Eclipse. Now, if you've done the threading part of this course, then you'll hopefully recognize this project. We wrote it in that part of the course, although I have edited it to put a little fault in that we can now look at as part of this piece of work on soft leaks. So if you haven't done threading, don't worry. I'll talk through the basics of this application, but we're not going to look at every line of code in detail. So we start with a customer class that just defines a customer object. It contains an ID and a name. We set the name in the constructor and the ID through a set method, and we have it a string that prints out both the ID and the name. Now, the customers are going to be stored in a collection, which is held in this class called Customer Manager. So Customer Manager has an array list of customers, and there are methods called Add Customer and Next Customer, which pulls out the customer from the list. And you can see there's some other methods there that I'm not going to touch on right now. Now, this is a threaded application, so we have runnable tasks. Those are here, the generate customer task. You can see that what happens is that there's a never ending loop that creates new customers and adds them to our customer manager. Now, it also calls get next customer, which if our application was running correctly, and I'm going to spoil it for you and tell you this is where the fault is going to turn out to be, that should remove a customer each time one is added. So our customer manager object, our collection, should never grow too big because every time we add a customer, we should be removing one. We're going to see there's a fault and those customers are not going to be removed. So that's the task and we run it from this harness class. And in there, if we just look at this, we are going to create 10 threads that are going to be adding those customers and they add thousands and thousands of customers. And then there's another thread that every five seconds is going to print out how many customers are in the collection and the amount of available memory. Now, if I just run this, we probably won't see anything that's going to be worrying. If I run it now, and we'll not get any output for five seconds, so you'll just need to bear with me. There's our first output. We've got 49,000 customers created, and there's quite a lot of available memory. We've got some more customers now, and you can see the memory's gone up. And in fact, the memory's gone up again. So we don't quite know what's going on. Now it looks like the memory's starting to go down again, but it's really unclear to me if there's any kind of problem here. So to detect this, what I'd like to do is to say, let's run this code with a much smaller heap, and then we'll hopefully identify if there's a potential code leak, or in other words, if we're keeping objects alive longer than we really want to. So I'm going to stop this running for now. And in order to set the maximum heap size that we want our application to use, I'm going to provide a runtime argument to the application. Now, we will look at a few of the different runtime arguments a little bit later in the course. But for now, what we'll do is go back to our package explorer. I'm going to right click on the harness and click on run as and choose, and I think it's just off the bottom of the screen, so you'll need to find it on yours. I'm choosing the option that says Run Configurations. In here, I'm going to go to the Arguments tab, and I want to provide an argument to the virtual machine, and that looks like this. It is dash, capital X, lowercase mx, that tells you how much is the maximum heap size, 
As I say, we'll talk through these arguments and some of the other options a little bit later on. And now we'll specify that by saying, well, let's give it a maximum of very small, let's say 10 megabytes. So that would be 10 and then an M for megabytes. So this argument says run the application with a very small heap size. So let's run it again with that. I'll click on apply and then run. Well, now we've almost instantly got some exceptions there. I'll just maximize the console. We can see we had some out of memory errors. So we know that something's gone wrong. We've run out of memory, which really shouldn't happen in an application that is generating very small numbers of customers. So we know that there's something wrong. Now, I'd like to monitor what's going on in this application, because at this point, I don't think I really understand what the issue is. I don't know why my application has run out of memory. So to do that, we'll use an application that comes with the Java JDK called JVisualM. Now, I'm on a Windows machine here, so I'm going to find that in my program files directory under Java and then my JDK in the bin folder, and the file is called jvisualm.exe. If you're using a Mac or a Linux machine, you just need to start the application that you'll find in the bin folder for wherever your JDK is located on your machine. So I've started the application up here, and I hope you're doing the same and following along as me. What we can see in this list under local is any applications or services that are running on my machine that are running Java that I can connect to. Now at this point, my application isn't running, but I have got a reference here to Eclipse. That's the Eclipse IDE. So let's connect to that and have a look at that first. So to do that, we're going to right click on the Eclipse and choose Open. Now I've got quite a small screen here, so I'm just moving some of the windows around to make things visible. And the first thing we'll notice in the overview is down here, that setting that we set for our application as 10 megabytes, the XMX parameter, we can see for Eclipse, that's on my machine at least set to 512 megabytes. So right now, Eclipse is set with a maximum possible heap size of 512 megabytes. The one above it, XMS, is the starting heap size. So when Eclipse starts running, it only asks the virtual machine for 40 megabytes, but over time it can request more memory until it's reached 512 megabytes. If Eclipse for any reason needs more than 512 megabytes, then it's going to crash. Now on your machine, these numbers might be different. They are based on the amount of memory that your machine has. Next, let's have a look at the monitor tab. And I'm particularly interested in this top right graph here that shows me the heap. I'm just going to close down the other graph so that we can see that in more detail. And what we've got here is the used heap in blue. So right now we can see that the highest amount of memory that Eclipse has used while I've been using it is around about 310 megabytes, it looks like. And at the moment, we've got somewhere around about 80 megabytes being used. We can see the amount of heat goes up and down. I'm guessing that each time it goes down, a garbage collection process is happening. So the virtual machine is able to release some of the objects that Eclipse has created that are now no longer referenced and are therefore available for garbage collection. Now, Eclipse is obviously doing something in the background because it's using more heap space over time. This slow gradient up tells us that more memory is being consumed and then it's being released. It looks to me like Eclipse is running as a very balanced application here because while nothing is happening, certainly we're not seeing an unmanageable increase in heap size. There are objects being created, but they're being released, and it looks like there's a stable level of memory that Eclipse requires. And in fact, that's the ideal. We want our applications, when they're running, to show this kind of graph that they're balanced and well behaved. They're not grabbing too much memory so that there isn't enough available for other applications. 
Let's now watch our application when it runs. In order to be able to monitor it, I'll need it to run for longer than it's currently doing. So we'll make a couple of little changes first. I'm going to just close the connection to Eclipse. We could leave that open, but because I've got a small screen, it'll be easier to close it. So here's the application again, and I think this time we'll run it with a heap size of 50 megabytes, which should hopefully keep it running a little bit longer so that we can monitor it. So we'll right click on customer harness and do run as and run configurations into the arguments tab, and we'll change the VM argument from a 10 megabyte heap to a 50 megabyte heap. We'll click on apply and run. And then we'll go into the visual VM tool. And I'm going to open up customer harness to the monitor tab. And let's close the graphs that aren't the heap graph so we can maximize its size. So what we can see here is that the blue line, the amount of memory that our application is consuming, is growing over time. There are some dips, so we know that the garbage collection is running, and each time it runs, there is some memory being freed up, but it doesn't look like very much memory is being freed up, and over time, this line is growing and growing. I'm going to pause the camera and let this run for a little bit longer, and then we'll see what happens. Okay, well, the application's been running for about two minutes now, and what I think we'll notice is that it has slowed down considerably. We should be getting an update every five seconds on how many new objects have been created, and what we can see is that the number of new objects between each of these lists is very, very small. So it looks like there's something going wrong. I'm just going to stop this running while I'm here. Let's go back into the visual VM, and well, that's a very striking graph. What we can see is that the amount of memory our application is using has actually plateaued. It's reached a level and it seems to have stopped there. So what's happened is that at this point, the garbage collection has been desperately looking for memory for new objects to be created in, but it really just can't find any. And if we left this running for a long time, eventually our application would crash. Although it hasn't crashed, as we saw, it had slowed down significantly. I'm not going to run it long enough to see that. We can already see now this is clearly a bad application. We've used up all the available memory, and the only thing we can now do is restart it. Now, I'm saying we've used all the available memory. Actually, the available memory was 50 megabytes. That's what we set the heap size to. And we can see that only 42 of it has been used. It looks like, in this instance, there's about 10 megabytes that just can't be used. Now, we'll find out why that's the case, why some of this memory can't be used to allocate new objects in the next chapter. So we'll be coming back to that point a little later on. So some projects might try and fix this problem by changing the size of the heap by altering that runtime value again. That's not a good solution. In fact, it's no solution at all, because no matter how big we make our heap, eventually this application is going to run out of memory. There is definitely something going wrong here, and we need to fix it. Now, I know that in my customer manager class, the issue is that we're calling dot get to retrieve a customer when we should be calling dot remove. And in fact, I've even got that commented here that that's what's wrong. So let's correct that now. Unfortunately, because this is a threaded application, it's not just going to be a case of changing this to return customers.remove. I need to have a synchronized block in here. If you haven't done the part of the course on threading yet, don't worry about that. Just copy in the code that I'm going to put in here, which should sort the problem out. So I'm going to remove the customers.get return line. And instead, I'm going to create a new customer called result, and I'll set that to null. And then within a synchronized block, so I'm putting in here synchronized and this to be the object to synchronize on. And within that block, I'm going to first of all check that the size of the array is at least greater than zero. And assuming it is, we can set result equal to customers.remove zero. And then outside the synchronized block, I can return the value of result. That should now work fine. So let's run this code one more time. We'll right click on customer harness and I'm just going to check we're still on a 50 megabyte heap size. I believe we should be. Yes, we are. So we'll click on run now. 
and we'll go once more into the visual vm and let's close the link to the previous version of customer harness and we'll open the new one go into the monitor tab and i'm going to leave this to run for a few minutes just to see what happens let's close the other tabs while it runs well in fact i think we can immediately see a very different graph here our 15 megabyte heap size most of it is available we've got some sharp downward movements so we know that there's plenty of memory being made available every time there's a garbage collection and actually if we left this running for a long time we'd see that the highest point of memory is really just not growing over time so this looks now like a very stable application it looks well performing it doesn't look like we've got a memory leak everything is working nicely so in this chapter, we've learned the basics of how garbage collection works. We first saw that the virtual machine uses something called string internalization as a way to reduce the number of string objects that are created and then destroyed over time. It does this by placing literal strings into a pool for reuse. We then talked about when an object becomes eligible for garbage collection. That is, when it's no longer reachable from the stack. And as an object is garbage collected, we saw that its finalized method is called. But there's no guarantee that the object will ever get garbage collected, so this method is pretty useless in reality. Very importantly, you must never put any kind of cleanup code that has to be run in the finalized method. And then we talked about memory leaks. We saw that while these are possible in Java, unlike some other programming languages, they won't damage the operating system. Our application might run out of memory. That's the worst that can happen. It's still bad, of course, we'll want to fix it. And we call these soft leaks. And we used the visual VM tool to look at the heap and how its usage changes over time. Coming up in the next chapter, we're going to continue learning about garbage collection. We'll be finding out more about how the process actually works using something called generational garbage collection. So I'll see you there.